The lesson comes from Matthew's Gospel, the end of the story almost. This is Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And I heard that when the choir went over the sending forth today, which you all get to sing with them, the dry bones song. You remember the dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Someone said, are you sure she doesn't want to wait for Halloween for this one? But that comes from Ezekiel. Ezekiel, that great prophet who saw weird stuff. He saw a wheel, he saw animals, he saw all sorts of things. God always spoke to Ezekiel through very vivid imagery and known more than the valley of dry bones. Reminds me of a kid I had in one of my churches. They called her Hobbit. Her name is Elizabeth. She's grown now. She would hate me telling this story. But she had barely turned four years old and it was vacation Bible school. I don't think there's a vacation Bible school curriculum ever written that does not hit Easter at some point during the week. And we were going to talk about the Easter story from one of the Gospels. And I said to the kids, I was the Bible teacher that year, I said, Did my mic, there we go. I said to the kids, it's the most wonderful story in all the world. It's the best story that ever happened, but before it happened, something really sad happened. Hobbit, who was barely four, said, I know, I know, I know. I can tell you, Pastor Terry. I said, all right, Elizabeth, tell me. And she said, well, Jesus was in the woods, and he was trying to pray, and people came, and they, they stuck him with spears, and they arrested him. Then they took him and they nailed him to a big X. They put nails right through his hands and his feet. It was terrible. We're all sitting on the edge of our chairs like, this is a four-year-old prophesying to us, telling us the story of the gospel. She said, well, then they took him off the big X and they put him in a hole in the ground. They didn't want him to get out of the hole, so they put a rock on the hole. Then three days went by, three days, three nights, and it was Easter, and they, took the, they went to get him out of the hole and they took the rock off. He wasn't there anymore. We were all astounded that a four-year-old knew this story. And then she looked at us and said, that's how Jesus became a zombie. <laughs> we realized then that we were a little bit too literal with kids sometimes. And what they hear is not what we're saying necessarily. It's one of those stories, isn't it? It's weird, isn't it? We've got all these bones. Imagine a valley full of bones, human remains. They're all out there. And Ezekiel's plopped down in the middle of this valley. And God says, look at all this. Now, Ezekiel is an interesting character because he prophesied about 400 years before the birth of Christ. He was a prophet of the Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian exile, which was the kingdom of Judah, where Israel, Israel was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern kingdom, and Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom of Judah. They had been carried away out of the land. They didn't take everybody, but they took the elite. They took the artisans and the craftspeople and the people with some means, and they carried them off. They didn't live as slaves, but they lived under the control of a foreign nation out of their land, away from their temple. Now, it seems like the war in Ukraine has gone on a long time, doesn't it? And if you think about the longest wars ever fought by the United States, I asked the early crowd, what do you think the longest wars we ever fought in were? Afghanistan is one and Vietnam is one. Civil War was not that long, really. It had the most casualties of any American war that we were in. More people died, more Americans died in the Civil War than any other war, but it didn't last as long as some of these others. Well, imagine being out of your land for 10 years and then the Babylonians went back and sacked Jerusalem, burned it to the ground, and destroyed the temple. We can't imagine what that would feel like, could we? Being taken out of our land and knowing that it's being destroyed and your children are growing up in a foreign land. They don't even know where they are anymore. They don't, they, all they hear about home is a story that you told and then that's destroyed as well. So your memories are destroyed as well as your future seems very lost. They felt hopeless. They felt helpless. They were just completely devoid of any sort of spirit. And God says to Ezekiel, that's what my people are like right now, this valley full of bones. God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? What does Ezekiel answer? Only you know, God. Tell me, you know. God said, prophesy to the bones. Can you imagine being sent to prophesy to people who are just that hard up and distraught and hopeless about the world situation, their own situation? 
Can you imagine being charged with that task? I can, because that's what I sort of do every Sunday, isn't it? I get to preach the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in the midst of terrible times. What are our dry bones? How has dried us out lately? I would say the pandemic, certainly. Y'all tired of the pandemic? Amen. We're tired of not knowing what's going to happen next, aren't we? Thinking it's over with and then it's back again. While people are getting these... Um, they're getting the virus and they're turning around and getting it three weeks later all over again. It's just a mess. Ever waited for a diagnosis? That is, that's like being in a valley full of dry bones, isn't it? When you don't know what's next with your own health, if things are going to get better, if they're going to get worse. Just a year ago on this very Sunday was the day we found Elaine up here on the floor when she had her stroke and we didn't know she'd had a stroke. Today is six years exactly from the day that I went home and found my husband on the floor after church after he had been sick for 10 years. He told us he would live eight years, and the last two, I, every time I put my key in the lock, I thought, is this the day? And it was the day. The war in Ukraine must feel so long to them, and it's not just the people in Ukraine who are suffering, although their suffering is greater than ours. We tend to whine a little bit because the gas prices went up. People in Europe are facing a very, very cold winter this year when Heating fuel will not be available it's enough. And they said if it's a bad winter there, people will be going cold in Europe, throughout Western Europe, not just Eastern Europe, Western Europe, they're going to be cold. Then if you have anyone in Florida, you have lived on just the edge of your seat the last few days watching what's been happening on the news. This is a storm that's expected to be one of the best, biggest killers of human life that they've experienced in Florida ever because they don't know the people on the islands. There's no way to get to them yet to know how many people have perished because of the storm. But the loss of housing has been incredible. There are still over a million people without electricity in Florida right now. Then you look at the political system in our country. People are just sort of lined up to shoot at each other, aren't they? I was watching one station one day this week and it said, you know, the problem with this country is the Democrats. Turn to the next one. The problem with this country, guess what that one said? The Republicans. And how wonderful was it to see a Republican governor working with a Democratic president because people had need and they put their differences aside. That's not something we're used to anymore, is it? Seeing people put their differences aside. Oh, mortal, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, God, only you know. Because Ezekiel at that point was probably tired of saying anything to people. Nobody wants to hear a prophet. Because prophets always have to preach what's not happening at the time. When people are doing well and they forget their need for God, they forget that God is the one who gave them the land to begin with. They forget that God's the one who's rescued them all these times. As soon as they forget God, God says, all right, I'm going to let you, you, you think you're in charge, go ahead. Then they reach this level. They're in exile. Now their temple has been destroyed. Can you imagine if someone came in and burned our church, what we would be feeling like someone intentionally destroyed our congregation this place of worship, we would be devastated, absolutely devastated. And that's what they're feeling. And then as soon as they hit bottom is when God says, all right, to the prophet, now tell them I will be with them, which is easier to believe at the moment, that you're going to fall apart or that you're going to be put back together. God's going to redeem them. So that's one of the bodies we're talking about today. The next is the body of all of us together throughout the world, the church as the body of Christ. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? And here Paul is describing a real physical body, a human body with hands and feet and arms that work and a head and the sense of smell, the sense of hearing, the sense of sight. And here we are in the story in Greece, in Corinth. I had the blessing of visiting ancient Corinth, which is still, the, the ruins are there because they never built a city on top of it. It's at the Isthmus of Corinth, strategically a very important city militarily, economically. It was where a lot of trade happened. People were there were very wealthy. On top of the hill was the Temple of Artemis, who was the patron of that city. And the Acropolis of Corinth is up on a hill. If there was any sort of attack on the city, people would run up there for cover. But also, they'd go up there to worship Artemis. And how do you worship Artemis, Diana, that one? By temple prostitution. It was an interesting place. There was Greeks and Jews alike. 
Paul is preaching, and you can actually see the place where Paul himself stood to preach if you go to ancient Corinth today. A lot of the pastors on my trip were getting their pictures taken there. I didn't stand there for fear that God was going to throw a lightning bolt at me saying, do you think he preached like Paul? Get out of there, girl. I did not get my picture taken there, but I saw it, and it's an amazing, beautiful place. But the reason Paul wrote this letter to the church, he loved that church desperately. He stayed there doing his tent making for about 18 months in Corinth. But people started to make distinctions between themselves, like, God loves me more than you, and you're less worthy than I am. And he said, no, 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 you're all part of the same body. You can't say, because you're not a foot, that, that the body doesn't need you. You can't say the head's more important. You can't say this is more important, that's more important. And so he writes this beautiful explanation of what the body of Christ is like, and we all have different gifts, and we need each other. Now... I started out in ministry in the conference as the youth director at St. John's in Lutherville, and when I was there, I was asked by the annual conference to be a consultant in youth ministry. I was invited in by churches all over the annual conference who wanted to start a youth program and show them how to do youth ministry. Now, this is the passage I read because we'd have a room with teenagers on one side and adults on the other side. The teenagers on that side are now probably pushing 50, but this is a while back. So they're there, and... I asked them what they thought of this, and the adults said, you know, basically we need to tell them what their place is, and I asked the kids, if you had to come up with a body part that you wanted to be or that you think that you're like in the church, what would it be? I got the same answer again and again and again. Guess what part the kids thought they were at the body? Any guesses? The big toe. I said, the big toe, and one kid said, yes, because they only know they have one if they stub it and it gives them pain. Wow, isn't that true? Otherwise, they said, people don't even know we're here until we're giving them pain. So I said, all right, let's make a list. What are the things you could not do if you did not have a big toe? That's some of the best answers I've ever heard. You all come, okay, Clark's got his hand up. What could you do without a big toe, Clark? Wouldn't be able to stub your big toe. Amen to that. If you didn't have a big toe, couldn't stub your toe, right? What else couldn't you do without a big toe? Your shoes wouldn't fit. What else can you do without a big toe? It's hard to walk. It's hard to balance. Hard to kick a ball. Oh, but they got more creative than that. They said if you dropped a pencil, you didn't want to bend over. If you didn't have a big toe, you couldn't pick up the pencil. That's a good one. My favorite was you could not wear flip-flops. That was the best one of all, because they said you just flip without the flop or you flop without the flip. I told a friend of mine that, who was a pastor, and she said, there's an African proverb that says, if, the, if there's the thorn in the big toe, the whole body must stoop to pull it out. That's pretty good, isn't it? Then she told me that she was the pastor of a church full of orchard men, because this was in Frederick, Maryland, and a, and a man who owned an apple orchard was in the tree with a chainsaw, brought it down and cut his own toe off. And she said he was amazed. He just thought, it's just my toe, but he could never balance himself again. He never walked right again and hurt his back because the knee bone's connected to the backbone and the leg bone. All his bones are connected, right? So that's the second body. We have the, the great sea of dry bones, then we've got the body of Christ that we're all part of, we're all members of. And then there's the body of Jesus Christ given to us in Holy Communion today. I always tell people this is the presence and power of Jesus that we have at our, at our disposal. Unfortunately, it's not a good word to use for that, but that's, we treat it very casually sometimes, don't we? Every morning of my life, I thank God for Holy Communion that reminds me of God's grace. Every I don't take communion every day. Every day I thank God for communion and baptism, the sacraments of the church. That's, I understand them. This is bread, but it becomes for us Christ's body in a way we don't try to explain. But we know that it is for us Christ's own body. It's the power and presence of God at work in us. If we start with that body, then we see ourselves as the body of Christ joined together because we're all part of the same whole. And if we see that, then we see... Sometimes we get a little dry, don't we? Amen, says the pastor with one arm. 
we can dry out a little bit. But if you want to get your energy back, come to church, share in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. It's the thing I missed most when we were on remote worship was being able to share communion with you all, being able to touch the bread and give it to you. And I'm not going to do that today, but we're going to we at least have real bread today. Yes, real bread, good stuff. This feeds our souls so that we can become the true body and blood of Jesus Christ in the world. The body of Christ redeemed by his blood is how we say it in our, our liturgy every time. Now, I don't know how many of you have watched it, but I have spent the last week watching and digesting Ken Burns' new documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust. Did anybody see it? I commend this to you to watch. It's sad, it's hard to watch because it tells the truth about how Hitler wanted to kill all the Jews, wanted to exterminate the Jews, and people in Germany went along with him. People always say, oh, it was all Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. No, he was one man. One man cannot murder 11 million people. Only when people go along with him can that happen, and everyone went along with him, not just in Germany, but even here, no one wanted the Jews. The St. Louis, a boat full of Jews, came here and we turned them away from our shores because we had a quota for immigration at that time. No one wanted the Jews to be here. And Hitler and Mein Kampf wrote about how he patterned his Third Reich policy toward Jews on the United States treatment of Native Americans and blacks. Sad things, isn't it? So I'm going to ask you to think about the body of Christ. Who is part of our body and who is not? Because according to scripture, all are one. Because what did it say down there? We can't say I have no need on you, no need of you. That if one member suffers, all suffer with it. And if one rejoices, all should rejoice with it. We need to learn to do that. And we can do that if we spend time together at the table of God, sharing in Christ's body and blood, which strengthens our souls to be in the world. And it's the spirit that empowers this body and blood in us. And it's the spirit that breathes into us. Because what does it say about the bones in those days? To say someone's, to talk about your bones in the Old Testament is a different thing than just saying, oh, I got an ache in my broken arm. Now, some people had heard this expression. Do I have any other, I got some West Virginians in here this morning, right? Any of our West Virginia natives here? Yes, John and Carrie are here. You know what it is to be tired, right? You know what it is to be exhausted. You know what it is to be bone weary. How many of you grew up hearing bone weary as a way to be? Bone weary, when you're so tired that your bones feel it. What did Adam say about Eve? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That's not just saying that God took a bone and made a woman out of it. That is saying that part of who I am at my core is now someone else. So can these bones live? What if God asked you, can these bones live? What do you say? Can these bones live? Not a rhetorical question. Yes, they can. If we let God work through this congregation, we will turn the world upside down from Cockeysville out. We will be a blessing to everyone we meet because we will have the breath of God in us, working in us and through us. We will be strengthened by the body and blood. And what we will do is we will invite other people to this table. We'll invite other people to share in Christ with us so that they know what we have, the power that we have in our hands. So I hope this morning when you come forward, don't, don't worry. I don't want you touching everybody else's bread. Really, you know, be careful when you pick yours up and when you dip, don't dip down to your second knuckle or anything like that. But I want you to enjoy it. I want you to taste it. I want you to understand that this is all that God is giving you so that you can give yourself to the world. I want you to rejoice and be glad and say, yes, Lord, my bones can live and sing and work for you again and again and again. We have come through a dark valley, folks, but God is with us. The future is uncertain, but we know that God is already there. We can and we will prevail with God if we continue to work side by side with God and remember that we are called to love the whole world. He's got the whole world in his hands, not the people who look like us and talk like us and act like us. He's got the whole world in his hands. Everybody here, everybody there, everybody everywhere in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Now, I'm sure you know what comes after this passage from Corinthians, right? 
Still, I will show you more in a more excellent way. What was that more excellent way? Because if you don't know any part of Corinthians, you know the 13th chapter. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient, love is kind, love is all those wonderful things. Love never ends. If we come together at this table, if we truly confess our sins and lay aside all the things that have broken us, we will come together in Christ's name and go into the world to do wonderful things through him. So now I'm going to invite you to join in with me as we continue to share in what Christ wants to give us through the power of the Spirit so that these bones may truly in fact live. Amen, amen, and amen.